Um, well, hello everyone. My name is Mariah Hill, and I'm a psychologist with Counseling and Psychological Services. Um, I'm Leslie Trumbull. I'm a doctoral intern at Counseling and Psychological Services. And we're going to talk to you today about uh, Safe Zone, which is a program that's been here on campus um, since 2009. It's a program that appears nationally in different universities and colleges around the U.S., so it's not something that was invented here, but each uh, college or university kind of puts their own personal stamp on it. And Safe Zone is a program that is aimed at increasing um, education and awareness around GLBTQIQ issues, and we'll get into those letters in a minute. Um, and in addition to um, providing more in information and education around it, um, also creating a, a safer campus um, for people that identify in that spectrum, whether they're students, staff, or faculty. So as GTAs, you're going to be teaching students and in, in working with other students here on campus. And so it's important um, to be aware of maybe some of these issues that may impact the students that you're working with um, and making sure that it's a safe learning environment for them. So the first thing that we're going to talk to you about is what are all of those letters? What do they mean? Um, and um, understanding kind of how they relate to one another and sometimes how they get confused for one another. And Leslie's going to take over yeah. that part. Do you mind writing the writing. terms? Okay. And I, so here, can you guys all see that? Okay. You know, it's kind of small. So um, if we consider identity, gender, gender and sexuality identity um, as a kind of a Venn diagram, um, it would be made up of these three circles or parts. The first one is sex, like your biological sex. Um, the second circle is gender. So how, um, do you guys have an idea of what, how gender differs from sex? Does anyone wanna take a stab at that? So it can be like how you, how you present yourself or the behavior is gendered Sex is like X, Y, X, X, and there are a number of other, um, other presentations as well. And then the third circle would be sexual orientation. So that is, that describes um, who you're attracted to. So um, for this activity, if you guys could just help us out a little bit here and throw out some terms. We'll start with the top circle for sex, biological sex. What are some terms you've heard that describe biological sex. Without peeking, if you can. Yeah, oh yeah, you guys have all of your Male. circles. Male. Female. Yes. <laughs> Any other? Trans. Transsexual, yes. And Any other? Hermaphrodite is um, one word. We use, the word that's commonly used now is intersex, but it's the same idea. So it's somebody who has some characteristics of both um, male and female um, sexes. That's a great question too. I appreciate your asking that. So um, transsexual is somebody who has changed sexes and has actually um, gone through surgery, right, to have the, the sex, um, gen the, sorry, sex organs changed. So we'll get to transgender too, which is different, but, but related. So intersex would be like you were born um, with maybe, there are a number of different presentations, XX. X, 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 Y, and they just have some masculine and feminine um, secondary sex characteristics. So as, as we talk about this, um, language is really fluid, and it's a reflection of our culture, so some of the terms may um, have changed. Um, for instance, hermaphrodite was a term that was used in the 80s, 90s, um, and it's changed now to intersex. And one of the things that why we're talking about this is because language is one of those things that can people can feel really nervous about in terms
terms of I don't want to offend somebody, but it can also be important to at least have some exposure to what is the terminology. It doesn't mean that you need to memorize these or that you know, you're never going to maybe say something that inadvertently um, is offensive to somebody or hurtful, but to at least have a beginning understanding and um, we'll talk more about like how does this translate to the classroom. Mm -hmm. So we'll put these terms up here in terms of things that might be more outdated, and the ones that appear in the bubble are going to be the ones that are more current. Yeah, you had a question? Um, it's biological sex, so that has to do with actually biological um, sex, but gender down here, we'll, we'll actually do this next. It's a little bit tricky, um, but I can be female biologically, but present in a masculine way, and that masculine way of presenting might be what I consider to be my gender. Does that, or that describes gender? Does that kind yeah. of get at it, or? Keep it in mind, and, and if, as we go through this, um, you have more questions, so definitely. Mm -hmm. Right. How you feel internally, behavioral rep representations, how you dress. So without giving too much of that away, um, do you guys have some terms that you've heard to describe gender? I just said masculine. Mm -hmm. The masculine male. Mm -hmm. Masculine male. Feminine. Mm -hmm. Do people know what transgender is? Or how it might differ from transsexual. So that might be So it can be, I think I'm getting at what you're headed towards, but you can change genders in multiple directions. So male to female, female to male. Um, and it's somebody who basically operates outside of the binary. So, so they're not considering the world to be just male and female. They see it as many other representations. Um, does that? <laughs> Yeah, basically transgender is anybody that doesn't conform to the gender scripts of the culture. So if I'm born male, I don't conform to masculine gender scripts in terms of how I behave or how I express myself. So, or if I'm female, I don't conform to feminine gender scripts. Can you think of examples of what might fall under that? Metro, metrosexual. Sure. Mm -hmm. Dra drag queen. I saw a hand here. Well, I guess could a transsexual be a drag queen? Could. Well, probably more a cross dresser. So we'll make it really confusing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what's the difference between a drag queen, 
king and a crossdresser. The reason. You said one was for entertainment. Yes. So drag king and queen are for entertainment purposes. Crossdressers may be people that are transgender, right? They're doing it more for emotional, psychological reasons. So a lot of times when people are transitioning, um, which you may encounter students um, in your classrooms that are in transition, um, they may start to cross-dress. A lot of times that's one of the initial ways that people start their transition. But it's not for entertainment purposes. It's more in terms of identity issues. I think one thing you're getting at is these little overlaps in the Venn diagram. Yeah, no, it's good. Good question. Um, one more to add here is a, a term that was new to me recently, cisgender, C-I-S gender. And that means that you present in, in accordance with your biological gender. Um, so a male who presents as male, female who presents as female. It's just another way to describe, to describe that. The dominant majority. So if you're born male and you feel male and present in a masculine way, you would be cisgendered. Mm -hmm. And uh, androgynous is another one. Oh, yep. Does everyone know what that term is? Gender neutral. Gender neutral, yeah. So if you're, most of you are probably too young, but if you've seen old uh, Saturday Night Live uh, skits with Pat, anybody? Yeah, okay, I see it <laughs> That would be an example of androgyny. Mm -hmm. Okay, so do you guys have any, any other ideas for that circle or any other terms that you think might fit there and you're not sure? All right, let's move on to the next. Um, the next circle is uh, sexual orientation. And so that gets at um, who you, who a person is attracted to. So any ideas of what would go there in terms of terminology? Straight. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's that's another one. <laughs> it it is. I know. <laughs> um, well, um, the the word that is commonly used is gay now, gay or lesbian. I see where you're because coming gay, from. I think. I, I chose homosexual because that includes gay and lesbians. Right. Isn't that more of an inclusive term? It is. It, I think. Right, especially when gender is so, can be fluid too. I think that the, the reason for it is because it kind of start to, started to take on um, a somewhat derogatory tone because the people usually talking about homosexual um, people were not. And so I think this is an example of something um, where the community itself decided we'd rather be called gay or lesbian. Um, and so that, that is, but it, it's a great question. I didn't, I didn't know that um, either. That's very interesting. Yeah. The other thing is that homosexual <coughs> used to be, um, in our field actually, we have a manual True. called the DSM, and it's basically what we use as therapists and insurance companies use for diagnosis of mental illness. And homosexuality up until the 1970s was considered a mental illness. Um, so the term homosexual had this, it had you know, quite a stigma um, attached to it in terms of mental illness. So, uh, so you know, the, the language and the fluidity of that changes within the community in terms of what's, what's included and what's excluded or what's considered pejorative and what's not. Um, it's, it's mainly determined within the community. Thanks for 
offering though, and for questioning it, because I think that's a question probably a lot of people have that I certainly had um, coming into this. So another example of that, I, I, I grew up in the 80s and 90s as a kid, um, and the term queer was actually considered very pejorative, um, and it's been reclaimed by the community. So, you know, we wouldn't suggest that you go and label somebody queer, but you, it, it will not be uncommon to hear people use the term queer in terms of self-identifying. Mm -hmm. And queer community you'll often hear, like the Queer Straight Alliance here on campus. Mm -hmm. well, is, is queer, is that like a, basically an equivalent to homosexual? I think queer is a is usually a broader term where maybe somebody doesn't want to identify as um, gay or straight. If they feel that they fall somewhere else. And they don't want to define themselves in that way. That's my understanding and how I've heard it used before. You and it's very individual. Sometimes people don't like the term gay or lesbian, and so they'll use queer instead. It's really a personal preference. Um, and you can, to make things even more confusing, you can actually also hear people talk about being queer in terms of gender, gender queer. Gender queer basically just means, again, anything that falls out of those scripts. Mm. Or gender bender, you might hear something like that. Mm -hmm. All right, do you guys have other ideas of what might go into the sexuality circle? Yes, pansexual. Any, do you want to? What was that? Asexual. Asexual, yes. Can you define these terms? Yeah. Bisexual. Bisexual. How, how about pansexual? Pansexual, is that a term that anyone's heard or you have a definition for? Wasn't it pretty much like you door swings open like all sorts of different ways, so to say, like you're don't, you'd be okay with having the sex act with any member of the race when you're not, or any member of each gender, but you're not really very selective? Not, uh, that's how I, that's how I. Not selective based on those, those representations, not, you're not yeah, only having the sex only with. The I've ever heard say that was, uh, was the guy's name from AFI. Anyway. From where? I appreciate that. <laughs> I don't think it necessarily means just sleeping with everyone, but, but not saying I only sleep with lesbian women or I only sleep with um, heterosexual men. So somebody who de defines themselves as pansexual is very open um, about who they're attracted. Okay, so more so than bisexual, or is it the same definition? <laughs> yeah, so bisexual are people that um, are attracted to men and women. Um, and it's not necessarily a 50-50 split. You know, it can be anywhere in there. Sometimes they may be more attracted to one um, sex than the other. Pansexual basically means all day anybody in the gender spectrum. Male, female, transgender, in transition. Basically, gender doesn't determine their attraction. So it's a little bit wider scope than bisexual. Mm -hmm. And then asexual? What was that? Not sexually active or attracted. Not sexually active or attracted. Yeah. Okay. Um, anything else on that list? Can you think of anything? I think the take home message and why we talk about this as you're working with students is that st students identify in different ways. And so it's important to be aware of that. You know, what are people talking about when you hear these terms kind of thrown out? Um, and, and the take home is not that you should know like how to label these people. It's about checking in with them. Mm -hmm. Always check in with them. 
even if they, you know, a female student comes up to you and says, I'm in a relationship with another woman, it's not, oh, okay, so you're lesbian. You don't know how that person is going to identify. Maybe they identify as queer, maybe they identify as pansexual, um, maybe they identify, we didn't put this up here, as questioning. Mm -hmm. So always check in, in with them. We've got one, and this one in here, it says down low. Okay. <laughs> Which one? <laughs> it says down low. Down low. Yeah. Down low basically is, um, it was a term coined within the African American male community. I don't know if it was back in the 60s or 70s. And it was basically m male African American men that have sex with other men on the down low, but actually identify as heterosexual. Mm -hmm. Only men identify as heterosexual. Identify as heterosexual. Yeah. That's where the where the term came yeah. from. And there's anyway. actually a term called men who have sex with men that still identify as heterosexual. So that's why it's always important to check in. You just never know how people mm -hmm. identify. From the outside looking in, sure. But sometimes, and, and it varies across cultures as well. We're kind of trying to stick with the US. But in some communities, um, depending on how you receive the sex or engage in the sex. Um, there can be different approaches to defining your sexual identity. Does that almost be like um, stories of that when people were isolated in groups and only one gender and then there were no women? Or is that just kind of what that would be for them in some instances? It could, yeah, where, where there isn't availability and people still engage in sexual activity with same sex, but identify still as heterosexual. Good example of that. Mm -hmm. I think one of the main takeaways really is, is to pay attention to what a student is telling you um, and the language that they use around it because uh, they probably put a lot of thought into defining themselves how they want to be defined. And um, it's, it's really great when we can honor that. Any questions about this? Do you think it's best, like, when in doubt, just to avoid that? <laughs> well, one of the one, of, like, why are we bringing this up, right? <laughs> are, how many students are coming to tell you about their sex lives? I don't know, but um, as a therapist, I hear about it. But, um, but one of the things that happens um, when students come to college is. They're away from home, sometimes for the first time in their life. And this is a period of identity development and formation um, where people start to examine things um, and express things maybe that they didn't express at home. And so uh, one of the things that we just wanted to touch on briefly was the coming out process. And that is something. So they may not be talking about their sex life per se, but students may be coming out when they come to campus. Um, Today, presently, currently, students usually have come out, at least to themselves and to someone else before they get to college, um, but not always. College may be the first time that they're coming out. Um, and so that may be something, you know, that you're exposed to, um, whether that's in terms of gender um, and they're playing, um, playing with their gender expression or, or it could be their sexuality and their they're coming out um, to students or friends. You may be exposed to that in the context of um, sometimes there may be students that are teasing, bullying, making comments. Um, there can be inadvertent or sometimes blatant outing where students out other, other students, which we strongly discourage because that's something that's really important for students to, to decide for themselves when, if, how, who, who they come out to. And it's a process that's always ongoing. You don't come out and then you're done. You know, if, if you fall in the spectrum, coming out is gonna be a lifelong process because you're continually encountering people that you don't know. Um, and some people don't come out and, and that's okay too. But 
when you're working with students, if that is something that they're dealing with, there could be all kinds of other stuff related to that that could impact um, their ability to feel safe, their ability to focus in the classroom. Um, again, they may not be talking to you about those issues, but maybe it comes out in the classroom in terms of them seeming like they're not showing up, they're not um, turning in their work, um, they don't feel like they're really engaged. So there's a lot of different ways in which this can emerge, and, and so we're just trying to kind of give you some background um, on some of these issues. That's a good question. We're not covering if they actually talk to you about sex today, so um, that would be maybe another workshop we would have to come up with, but. Any other questions? Yeah. We didn't formally have that in the presentation. There was a research um, project done. I think they identify between three and six percent here on campus, but that's people that actually are out identifying. So you figure there's more that aren't out. Yeah. And in terms of the safety piece, I mean, a lot of a lot of it is what what when we don't know who's in the room. And, and it doesn't even necessarily have to be somebody that identifies in this spectrum. Maybe they have a brother or a sister or a parent um, that identifies in this spectrum. And you know there could be issues related to that or if there's comments made in the classroom, which now we're kind of getting into that. Um, I think one of the things that I hear um, that happens on campus is there's this this phrase that is used by students that sometimes related to that's so gay. I don't know if anybody has heard that comment before or heard people refer to that, that's so gay, meaning that's so stupid. Um, but again, it's, it's about what's the, implicit, what's the implicit message and what's the impact of that. You know, if somebody identifies as gay or they have a family member that identifies as gay, um, and as teachers, if, if you don't respond to that in your classroom, then you know, what, how does that set things up for that potential student, or for that student potentially? So we wanna talk about ways to create a safe classroom. Yeah. <clears throat> did you have a question or? Did, okay, I saw something, my peripheral vision there. Um, so ways to create a safe zone in the classroom. Um, Mariah mentioned um, addressing things that come up, like if another student says that's so gay, maybe commenting that that maybe isn't the best description for what they're trying to say and ask them to come up with a different word. Um, that falls into just using inappropriate or insensitive remarks um, that might be hurtful to another one of your, your students. Um, so avoid making jokes about gender or sexual orientation is one way. Um, using non-gender specific language whenever you can is a good way. Um, so instead of maybe always, if you're talking kind of in theoretical and you're always using he, um, that might send a little implicit message to your students who don't identify as he. Um, and so switching those pronouns can be actually pretty impactful on students. Um, if you have your own personal biases towards uh, GLBTQIQ students, um, you can know that there are ally staff around campus. So we're both allies. Um, there are a number of people on campus, staff and other students who've gone through, through a safe zone training that's a little bit longer than this and have a, a little logo and students are in Yep, that logo. Um, so if students see this, they should know that that's a safe place to come and talk to, to anybody who's displaying that. Um, so don't feel like you have to, as the GTA, 
field all of these questions and talk to your students about something you're uncomfortable with, just know where you can send them um, for those sorts of conversations. Um, don't assume that everyone's heterosexual, because they're not. Uh, and be aware of how that might come through in your language. For example, um, asking a, a woman if she has a boyfriend or a husband, or asking if a student is going to see her mom and dad over um, the Christmas holiday or something like that. Just sort of being aware that that isn't the case for everyone. You can use the words partners, um, spouse, uh, parents, instead of boyfriends, moms, dads, husbands, wives, um, girlfriends. So another way to, to um, create a safe zone in the classroom is when you're teaching and you're including examples of role models in your field, you can identify, if you know people in the field who identify as um, gay, lesbian, um, transgender, bisexual, or anywhere on the spectrum, you can include them in your teaching. And um, when you're talking about current events, you can also bring in um, current events dealing with same-sex marriage, um, if that's applicable to you issues that are, that are applicable to these students. Um, and then the final thing we actually touched on in the beginning, just making sure that your students know that um, jokes, actions, behaviors that kind of target this population won't be tolerated in your classroom can really go a long way to making those students who identify in these ways a little more comfortable. So, any questions about that or other ideas? They actually changed it um, this summer and added uh, gender expression and gender identity. So it is MSU policy that students not be discriminated or harassed based on gender expression or gender, identi gender identity. And if they are, they can follow grievance procedures to, to file a grievance. So just something to, so it, it's something that's, it's present. Um, and people are aware of it, even at the administrative level on campus. What if you avoided like terminology that had anything to do with sexual orientation when you talk to people? You know, if, you know, if you're saying with when they're talking about their beloved ones for the holidays, like instead of saying you know, your parents or your husband, wife, father, or mother, if you just said like family and friends. And yeah. So, Yeah. I mean, that is what is recommended, is just to, to, to use inclusive language. So if you said um, parents or caregivers, or if you said partner or significant other, that's really inclusive. It, it could be anybody. Um, but if, if you're talking to a student that's male and you say, well, what's your girlfriend's name? It, you know, it assumes something. It assumes that they're heterosexual. Um, so, so yeah, the recommendation is just to, to use language that is inclusive um, and not assumptive of, of somebody's identity. Yeah, yeah. that totally is a question. Because that's, you know, that seems like what you would do if you were, if you were unsure about it, somebody's character at this point and has to avoid any specifics, but not to offend anybody. Yeah, and our recommendation would be to use that with everyone. Yeah. Because you just never know. Yeah, and that way everyone feels I included. Um, so the other thing that we were gonna touch on um, is on page seven, that's tips for responding to homophobia. Um, we did include the term homophobia in here, even though the more current term is homonegativity. Um, phobia suggests, especially in, in a therapy context, uh, an irrational fear, um, and really that's not, not what it's about, an irrational fear. It's more about misinformation and um, systemic um, practices of discrimination. Um, but we, we have it in there. So, um, so these are just some ideas about if something were to emerge in your classroom, let's say a student makes a comment, um, what are some ways in which you could respond given that 
um, you're in a leadership and uh, role in which you're modeling, right, for the students. Um, so we'll just kind of move through these, and if you have questions as we're touching on these, um, feel free to pop up your hand and we can talk about them as we're moving along. Um, but the first thing is informed. So if, if students are making um, homophobic or we could even say heterosexist comments, um, a lot of times they're, they're working with inaccurate information. And so one of the approaches that you could do would be um, that you could just provide, provide information um, in a way that's gentle and, and not shaming. Um, but, you know, there's all kinds of information out there that even changes. So um, it's hard for me, and I'm in, you know, this is one of my kind of things that I focus on, but it's hard. I'm always um, encountering new terms, um, learning something new. So uh, I think you can approach it from a way that it's another learning opportunity, right? And that's, that's what students are in the classroom. Um, for, but in a way, again, that's gentle and, and not shaming. Uh, another way that, that you could handle things is to um, acknowledge what they're saying, not just dismiss it, right, um, but have a dialogue about it. So acknowledge what the other person is saying. Um, it doesn't mean that you have to agree with what they're saying, um, but also realizing that people come to classrooms with different backgrounds, different um, experiences, different belief systems. Um, so holding that um, in mind when you're acknowledging where they're coming from. And sometimes it's just agreeing to disagree. Um, I think number three is kind of um, similar to that. Four, you could ask questions, so make sure that you understand where the other person is coming from. Maybe it's just a, a misinterpretation of something that someone is saying, so you could clarify things. I think the other thing, too, is, is when you're in the classroom, um, you know, to try to stay calm um, and polite and appropriate when you're talking about these things. They can feel really personal, and especially if uh, you identify in the spectrum or know somebody or have a family member, um, but trying not to approach it from a hostile or angry place. Um, find common ground. So think about, okay, is there something that you, know, you, could, you can both agree on that might start as a, a place from which to have that dialogue that was touched on earlier? And then last is don't be a fixer. So it's not about, um, and that's not what we're here to do either about um, telling people what they have to believe um, or changing um, people's value systems or those sorts of things. But it's really about, you know, again, coming from a place of information and then, you know, letting them do what that as they want. Um, maybe it's planting a seed for them to kind of take and, and think about and evaluate. I mean, that's really what a, I think a large part of coming to school is about. Yeah, you're taking in information and you're learning things, um, but some of those things can be on a really personal, personal level. And sometimes I think that's even the greater learning that happens in um, times when we're in college. So not feeling like you have to convert somebody or change their mind in a moment. At the same time, as as teachers, you are in that leadership role, and you do want to make sure that there's safety in the classroom. So you can agree to disagree, and people can have different perspectives and different belief systems, and at the same time, they can be respectful in, in having those differences in the ways in which they communicate them. And I think the language is one of those that is a reflection of that. So not using derogatory comments or pejorative comments. Thoughts? Has anybody had anything like this come up in their classrooms or are you all first time teachers? Okay. So these could be things that you'll encounter as you dive in. Yeah. 
So the other thing, and, and Leslie touched on this, is if there are any issues related to this, you can always refer students or you could call our offices or the Diversity Awareness Office. Um, our number is extension 4531. Um, and we do have a page in here on when to refer students to a mental health professional, and this isn't I mean, really, this doesn't have to be just for GLBTQIQ students because we see, we see a lot of students um, here on campus. Uh, so um, these are things that would be true of somebody that presented in the spectrum, but it could be true of any student. Um, so if you're working with students, like I said, and you notice like changes in the classroom in terms of their behavior, they either, you know, they're not showing up or when they are showing up, they seem um, like they're not, you know, fully present, which there could be a lot of reasons for that as students presenting. But if over the course of your relationship with that student, you learn that they're experiencing significant anxiety, they're having panic attacks, um, there's depression, certainly if there's any kind of suicidal thoughts, um, we, we are here on campus and we are a resource for students. We're free if they're taking at least six credits um, and we're confidential. So um, please remember that we are a resource for all students, not just those that fall in the GLBTQIQ spectrum. And, and every year we do a number of consultations with professors from different departments that have concerns about students. So that is something that you could encounter um, and you certainly don't have to be the counselor. You don't have to manage that or negotiate that on, their, on your own. You may end up talking to your professor that you're working with, um, but you could also talk to us. In addition to referring the student, we do, we do consultation as well. So you're always free to call us and we'd be more than happy to talk to you about any students that you're concerned with. Any questions about that piece? Great question. Um, so Counseling and Psychological Services is located above Student Health Services, um, which is connected to the sub. So we're in 211 Swingle. Yeah, facing Roberts, facing east. Up on the second floor. How do you what? We're kind of tucked. Um, if you go out the sub, it's kind of by the procrastination theater, procrastinator theater. Sorry, I'm new here. Um, you go out those doors, and then there's we have our own private entrance, um, just straight in front of those doors, and there's stairs up to the second floor. But if you if you went into student health services or referred someone there, they would help them get to where they need. And, and we have had professors literally walk a student over. Like if a student ends up coming into your, I don't, do you have office hours as GTAs? Okay. If a student ended up coming and, you know, you're, you're thinking they're coming into your office to talk about their grades and you end up talking about why they're struggling with their grades and, and it seems like there are personal issues that are coming up that you feel like they need, probably would do well to talk to somebody. Um, sometimes that, that bridge is easiest if you just walk them over um, and you can, and then you know the front desk is up there and they'll schedule the student um, for an appointment and if, if you just let them know who you are and that you're walking, you know, you're coming over with the student and feel like it would be helpful for them to see somebody um, and especially if somebody is walking somebody over, if it feels like it's that um, serious, then we'll try to see them as soon as possible, a lot of times the same day. So we prioritize those students. We do have walk-in hours. Um, yeah, at our one o'clock, every day at one o'clock we have a walk-in hour. Um, but, I mean, if a student ends up coming in cr what we call in crisis, um, 
we prioritize that and we'll find a way to see them. Even though we don't have a formal walk-in hour every hour of the day, somebody will have an open hour that will we'll fit them in. Yeah. Any other questions about Safe Zone or just our services in general at Counseling and Psychological Services? Sometimes students may have reservations about coming in to see us. Sometimes there's still that stigma of, well, you have to be crazy, you know, to, to see a therapist, but we really do see a lot of students and it's been increasing um, actually at a faster rate than enrollment. So I think we're up over 30% this year and it was the same last year. So, um, yeah. It's confidential. Um so even if you were to walk somebody over, you wouldn't have access to any, you couldn't even say that they mm. came to an appointment. So you can reassure your students of that. Um, we see people who are struggling with identity issues, with homesickness, just adjustment to college. Um, so it's not just um, depression, anxiety, trauma. It's a really wide range. Mm -hmm. But we do see students for all of those as well. We do, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just out of curiosity, do you get more ages than others? <laughs> um, that's a good question. I don't know that we track those. We track statistics for certain things, but I don't think we track statistics necessarily for major. Or if we do, I'm not aware of those numbers. It seems like there are some that seem harder. <laughs> but. but but I mean, yeah. it, it runs the gamut in terms of major. We see undergrads, we see graduate, we see students from Montana, we see students from outside of state, international students. Yeah, there's no like demographic for people that come in for counseling. It really it covers the spectrum in terms of students that end up enrolling. Well, thank you all for having us, and uh, I wish you all well in your first uh, semester of graduate student teaching. It's exciting. I know our, ours is kind of a serious subject, but hopefully you enjoy the semester and wish you well. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you very much. Yeah.